We do give thanks to the Lord for what he has done and what he has yet to do. This morning we'll be reading from the Old Testament book of Isaiah, chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, found on page 676 in your pew Bibles, if you'd like to follow along there. Isaiah, chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. This is what Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills, and all nations will stream to it. Many peoples will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Come, descendants of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Let me just say at the beginning of this message for all of you today, Happy New Year! For those of you who might not be aware, the first Sunday in Advent also marks the beginning of a brand new church year. It's the Sunday where the lectionary readings follow a different schedule than the previous year. It's when the church begins to be decorated with all those signs of the season. We have the Advent wreath in front of us here, prominently displayed at the front of the church as we light additional candles each Sunday until we finally arrive at Christmas and we get to light the Christ candle. So let me say again, Happy New Year. The season of Advent is upon us. As I mentioned a few weeks ago, we're going to be doing something a little different this year as we explore the season of Advent through the eyes of the prophet Isaiah. And in case you think this is kind of a a rather odd thing to do, let me just say that many of our beloved and traditional readings we hear during the season of Advent actually come from the book of Isaiah. The New Testament writers are drawing on and quoting things that uh, directly apply to the coming of the Savior. And so we are going right to the source over the next few weeks as we explore what God said through Isaiah the prophet about the future, particularly as it relates to our future hope and the coming of the Messiah. But before we begin to explore this first reading from Isaiah this morning, I want to say something about the observance of Advent itself. I say it every year, but I'm going to say it again, that Advent is to be understood as a time of reflection and as a time of preparation. The Latin meaning of the word Advent simply means coming. And that, of course, is referring to the Lord Jesus Christ as when the Lord comes. Unfortunately, the mistake that many people make is to concentrate only on that moment in history when God appeared in the form of a helpless baby in the, in the little manger in Bethlehem. That is the moment in time when God came to us so that he might be like us except without sin that he might save us from our own sins to be our savior and redeemer. Indeed, that event is vital for our lives of faith. We all know that. But that is only half the story. Our salvation is not complete simply by Jesus taking on human flesh and dwelling among us. Christmas needs something more. And what Christmas needs is Easter, where Jesus took on the sins of the world upon himself, yours, Mine, the world's, and the reason he did that is so that we might live. We might not experience the kind of judgment that is required for sinners. So Jesus took the sins of the world upon himself. But even that, too, is not the whole story. Jesus took on human flesh at Christmas. Jesus gave up his life for us at Easter. He even ascended to the right hand of God the Father Almighty. But our salvation is not complete until that moment in time where our eternal life begins and Jesus' reign as King of kings and Lord of lords is happening. What that means then is that we are still looking to that day, yet future, when Jesus will come again. And Advent is meant for us to think about both ends, both bookends, if we could refer to it that way, of our salvation. So for those who uh, have already placed their faith in Jesus Christ... Advent is our reminder that we are not home yet. 
And we are still looking for that day when Jesus will appear in the clouds and every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. It's a day yet future. All this is to say Advent is not simply a preparation for Christmas. Advent is rather a time when we are to reflect on what God in Jesus Christ has done for us already and what God has yet to do in Jesus for us. Therefore, since Advent means coming, as believers, we certainly enjoy the celebration of God becoming flesh in the form of an infant at Christmas. But the main thrust of Advent, the second coming, is to prepare an expectation for that time where Jesus is going to come again. Accordingly, then, any time we are in need of preparing ourselves for God's purposes, it always necessitates an honest and purposeful look into our own hearts as we examine our own lives in light of what God uh, proposes that our lives are supposed to look like. And with such a personal examination, the revelation of our own failings quickly is brought to light, which is why the theme of repentance is always at the forefront of all of our Advent themes. Of course, turning to God in repentance is the heart of Isaiah's message to the people of Judah. Further, Isaiah is pointing his readers to future events, things that have not yet happened, events that point to people like John the Baptist, who makes a way, makes straight the path for the Lord. He points to Mary's virgin birth, even, which allows Jesus to become the Son of God in human flesh. He points to Jesus as the Messiah himself who would die for the sins of the world. And of course, Isaiah points to that time when the end comes. And Jesus is finally going to take his place as ruler and as king. All these things God has revealed, believe it or not, to the prophet Isaiah. So Isaiah reminds us of the tension that we live in as believers because even though God is the God of the future, we live in a time of expectation because the consummation of our salvation has not yet happened. We're still waiting for that day. And that truth is meant to bring us hope. We know God is sovereign. And we know things are going to happen according to God's time and according to God's plan. And so that, is, that idea, that truth, that understanding is meant to bring us hope, which is the theme of this first Sunday in Advent, hope. And even as we long for that day of final consummation, even as we live in this rather uncertain world, does anybody think this world is uncertain? There are some, some things that we can be certain of as it concerns the future. We can be certain that the city of God will be revealed as the source of life for the world. Let me set you uh, the historical stage. The passage we re uh, read is from the second chapter of the book of Isaiah, in which the prophet is describing all these things that are yet to happen in the future. This is striking because it's vastly different, very, very different than what Isaiah was talking about in the first chapter of his book. In fact, the first chapter of Isaiah can be described as warnings against the sins of God's people. For instance, verse 4 of chapter 1 of Isaiah says this, Woe to the sinful nation, a people whose guilt is great, a brood of evildoers, children given to corruption. They have forsaken the Lord. They have spurned the Holy One of Israel and turned their back on him. Not a very good uh, encouraging text for God's people. But the whole chapter goes on with very vivid descriptions of the people's sins, their unfaithfulness, with the possibility of restoration and repentance as being only something that is kind of hypothetical. That might happen, but I doubt it, because the people just aren't willing to do it. So the change in tone in Isaiah chapter 2 is strikingly abrupt. It's like a 180, almost. This is what Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills, and all nations will stream to it. Verse 2 gives us a time frame for what Isaiah's vision is showing him, and that time frame is described as the last days, something that is yet future. And the subject of this first aspect of the vision of his glory that Isaiah was given is focused on the Lord's temple in the city of Jerusalem. At that time, that is, in the time yet future, the temple of the Lord will be not what it currently is in Isaiah's time which is the exalted place where God meets with his people and which the nations come and stream to it 
Isaiah actually says. They flocked to it. The people of Judah and Jerusalem had turned their backs on God. They had sinned. They had forsaken their God. They worshipped other gods in his place. They ignored the law of God for their lives. And they lived in injustice and unrighteousness. And they chose blatant sin over faithfulness and even shunned the idea of being repentance. We don't need that. So in light of the picture that Isaiah has painted for us, uh, the image is of a defiled and soiled people worthy of God's judgment set against the image of a holy city with the people and the nations all flocking simply to be in the presence of God. Very different images indeed. And I think that's important because it highlights the understanding that no matter how bad or grim things might be or continue to be for the immediate future, the distant future beckons the people to live a different kind of life. Without repentance, people have no hope of God's blessing. Without turning to him in obedience and in humility, their obstinate sin will only lead to God's judgment, as it always will for people of every age and every generation. This is a prophetic message that applies, as we said, to you and me, to people 40 years ago, people 100 years ago. It's relevant. And the people turn their back on God, the only outcome is the judgment of God. And it doesn't matter if we're talking about ancient Judah or modern Europe or modern America. I remember hearing a, about a comment that then Prince Charles made about the time when he would become king of England. He said one of the first things he would do would be to separate the Church of England with the state. For those of you who don't know, the Church of England is the official English church. It's a church of the nation. Prince Charles vowed to separate it, remove those two, separate those two, which is a sentiment that uh, no doubt reflects the general feeling of England about matters of faith. Of course, Prince Charles is now King Charles, so we'll have to wait and see if, his, if he's going to make good on his promise. Did you know in England, less than 50% of marriages take place within a church? Why? What that tells us is that people no longer feel the need to include God in their marriages. Instead, their marriages are done as civil unions rather than a religious ceremony, which means that they are bound together not by making a covenant before God, but by simply signing their names to a prepared legal document that was made by the magistrates. In such instances, marriages can very easily be dissolved when the laws of the state are replaced by the laws of God, all the way around. The laws of the state replace the laws of God because nobody wants to listen to the laws of God anymore. Same is true in America. Scholars and theologians tell us that we are now living in a post-Christian world, whatever that means. What I think it means is that the core beliefs of the Christian faith that used to be the guiding principles for the people of this country have now been thrown out. The question, of course, is that if we're not living according to the principles of God, then what are the principles that are guiding us? And you probably have several answers to that question. As the great Solomon once said, there is nothing new under the sun. People never change. People never learn from their own histories. Human nature remains the same. And when we begin to think about our own world and the absolute lack of desire for the things of God, then we can easily begin to see the comparison between the people of Isaiah's day and in the people of our own day. Turning their backs on God, forsaking God, not caring a lick about the things of God. Our own time looks rather bleak. And the near future doesn't look all that, all that exciting either, does it? So what hope is there? What hope is there? But hope is what Isaiah is pointing us to. No matter how bad things may get or how inconsequential God might appear to be to the people of this world, we can hold on to the truth that God is the God of the past, he's the God of the present, and God is the God of the future. Time is in his hands and all things belong to him. As Isaiah has shown us in his vision, there will come a time when the world will seek to draw near to God and flock, literally flock, to Jerusalem to worship the one true God. When will that happen? Well, all we can say for certain is that 
This is a time that is yet future for us, the last days, as Isaiah tells us here. And I think the point is to remind us that God always holds a remnant of the faithful for himself. In other words, even in the midst of a culture or a nation or a world that absolutely rejects God out of hand, doesn't give him a second thought, there is always those who keep the faith, who trust in their God and know that God will bring all things under his submission according to his time. The Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills and all nations will stream to it. For us who live in faith, we can be certain that the city of God will be revealed as the source of life for the world one day. One day. And further, what we can say is that we can be certain that the Lord will be the source of truth for the world. Is the Lord the source of truth for the world now? I think we all know the answer to that question. In fact, for much of the modern world, there is no such thing as truth. Your truth might be different from the truth of someone else, and their truth might be different from another person's truth. You just sort of make up truth as you go, right? Isn't that the, the modern way? The common saying for postmodern, the postmodern world is that there's no such thing as absolute truth. And of course, the, the, the obvious question you ask when somebody makes that statement is, are you absolutely sure? Because you can't make an absolute statement about something that is not absolute, right? We live in an age where all sorts of information is called into question. Have you found that to be true? We don't know if something is true, whether it's something it's, uh, we read on social media or read in the newspaper or even hear on, the, on a nightly news broadcast. We don't know if it's true. We've been taught to, tw to, to question everything, ev all information that is presented before us. One reporter might say something and someone else will say, well, that's fake news. What's fake news? It's someone making a statement that is meant to inform people with the truth only to, to, be, discover to be discovered that that statement that they made was actually false maybe even deliberately false. And so we question, what is truth? When Jesus was brought before Pontius Pilate, Pilate said to him, you are a king then. And Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. For this cause I was born. And for this cause I have come into the world that I should bear witness to the truth. And of course, Pilate asked the question, well, what is that? What is truth? Jesus says, everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. In a world that rejects the notion of truth, Jesus makes it clear that truth can only be found in God. And the vision of Isaiah points us to that time when the whole world will finally, finally realize this fact. Truth it can only be found in God. That might seem something that is very far removed from our own world, but it will happen. It is certain. Many peoples will come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Sounds like an exciting time, doesn't it? But that certainly wasn't the scenario in Isaiah's day. And it certainly isn't the scenario of our own modern world. But there will come a day when all the people of the world will not only seek out the truth of God's word, but will also teach others about God's word and, and, and the truth that they have got by it that affects their own lives. Let me also point out to you something that is really quite remarkable and that Isaiah is already prophesying that this divine plan includes all the people of the world. This is not limited only to Jews as God's chosen people. We saw that in verse 2, that all the nations will stream to the mountain of God. This is quite something. The rest of the passage continues with that same idea, which means that the vision Isaiah sees is what God is planning to do for the future, not only for the Jews, but for the Gentiles as well. That's something unheard of in the Old Testament. So what is the purpose of all the people coming to the mountain of God and learning his ways? Well, the answer is so that they might know how to walk in his paths. To live in a manner that not only honors God, but brings the blessings of God to life. And that is a fundamental truth, isn't it? Unless we learn God's ways, we cannot walk in God's paths. 
We might learn the ways of the world and walk comfortably in those paths. We learn all kinds of things, don't we? We're bombarded with the things that we are supposed to, to take into ourselves that tell us how to live, how to be like everybody else. Without learning from God, we will not live according to God. In the words of one commentator, those who will not leave their own self-sufficiency and come to God cannot learn his and their own ways, but the learning is for the purpose of living. What does it mean to come to God in order to learn from him? Well, one obvious thing, at least from an Old Testament context, is to learn from God through his law. In fact, one, uh, one of the main charges Isaiah brings against the people is that they have abandoned their obedience to the law of God. They have forsaken it, turned their backs on it. So the implication then is that they are living in a manner that is contrary to what God requires. This notion is simply expanded when we get to the New Testament and look at it in context so that we might learn from the teachings of Jesus, which he himself says are meant to fulfill the law. I think we can also say that learning from God might very well be a painful thing. You think that's true? If we use the Apostle Paul's description of the law being like a schoolmaster, what it does is reveal our own imperfections. It tells us where we went wrong. It highlights those things where we have fallen short of the glory of God. And so when we come to the Lord to learn from him, we also learn about ourselves, don't we? which is why humility and repentance always play a part when we seek to know God's truth. Can you imagine a world that has put away fleshly things and earthly desires and seeks only to know God's truth and to live by it? Is that hard to imagine? Although it seems far removed for our, from our own current reality, Isaiah is again reminding us of what God has in store for our future. A future that seeks God's truth and desires to live by it. The Lord will be the source of truth for the world. So what would that look like if that were truly the case? What would it mean for people of the world when they choose to live for God? What, what does that encompass? Well, that brings us to our last certainty for this morning, and that we can be certain that the Lord will be the source of peace for the world. The natural and sinful nature of a human person is one of selfish ambition, selfish preservation, isn't it? We want to do what's best for ourselves. And when you have more than one person with a selfish ambition and that self-preservation idea running their life, well, the result is always going to bring conflict. It's inevitable. What did Cain do to his brother out of jealousy? He killed him. What have people and cultures and nations always done out of selfish ambi ambition and self-preservation? Well, they kill each other. They kill the people who are standing in the way of, of them achieving the goals that they desire for themselves. You have something I want, and since you won't give it to me, I'm going to take it. I'm not sure if there's ever been a time in the history of the world where there has not been some kind of war being waged in this world. What is the cause of wars? Well, we've kind of already alluded to that, didn't we? I want to read to you something I came across this week that I think speaks well to this question. What is the cause of wars? When a person or nation decides that he must supply his own needs and that he is the final judge both of what it is his legitimately and how those needs might be gotten from somebody else, the weaker are trampled and violence results. To say it another way, one nation believes that they need what somebody else has, and so they take it from them through violence. Mankind is always trying to find and come up with new and creative ways to kill each other, aren't we? Whether we're talking about Babylon, ancient Egypt, whether we're talking about Greece or Rome, Germany, England, and even America. Wars are created when one country seeks to obtain something else from another country out of selfish ambition and self-preservation. It's unfortunate that that particular nation was built on top of that oil that's ours, so we're going to take it. When Lewis and Clark were commissioned by Thomas Jefferson to explore this new land that America had purchased from the French called the Louisiana Purchase, 
We know that land was already occupied, right? It was already inhabited by the Native Americans. America wants this land. And so a battle ensued with the Native people. But if you know anything about that, you might also know that even within the Native tribes and all the, the Native cultures that existed, there were also wars that were already being waged between those tribes. They weren't getting along either. One tribe would want something that another tribe has. And so wars just seem like a, a natural part of humanity, doesn't it? Wars can only be destructive and lead to death and poverty and slavery. And with the news headlines that we can see every single day, wars just seem to always appear to be with us. Serious wars. But what Isaiah reminds us here is that one day all wars are going to come to an end. And all reasons for war are going to be removed. This is what we can define as true shalom. True peace, the kind of peace that only God can provide. He will judge between the nations and he will settle disputes for many peoples. That is to say, God himself will settle matters and his word will be just and fair and final. There will be no reason to dispute the verdict. So this scenario can only be possible, of course, if God is seen to be the maker and sustainer of all things. He is the judge of all. And if such reliance upon God is embraced by the world, then all selfish ambition and self-reliance is removed. We don't need to feel that way anymore. And it's here where we read Isaiah's famous words. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Something happened. Something is different, vastly different. And that something is only something that God can do. The truth of the matter is that true peace can only be found when people know and live for God. Therefore, when we hear about things like peace talks and treaties that are made between nations, that kind of peace is, is simply an illusion, and it will not last. Treaties can and will be broken. Our own country has a sad history of that fact. Selfish ambitions can rise up and one side of a peace negotiation can attack the other side when they're vulnerable. And that cycle will continue until the world embraces the truth that God is the God of truth. God is the true judge. And recognize that, fa that, that fact and seek to follow in that path. And it's only then where Isaiah's vision will be fulfilled and tanks will be turned into to tractors. Green or red tractors, I don't know, I'll let you debate that matter. Knives will be used for farming implements, plucking the grapes. There'll be no need for instruments of war or to train to be ready for war. God's peace is a lasting peace, one that will never be turned into conflict again. We long for that day, don't we? Again, that seems like a distant hope as we look at some of the things that are going on in our own world, even today. But Isaiah's vision is sure. This is what God has in store for his plan of redemption. And this is also our longing today as believers when we look to that coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in the clouds. He will be judge and he will be king. He will be Lord of lords and every tongue will confess this truth that you and I already live by. I hope so. I hope you live by that. We know that the day is coming. And that is why we live in both hope and in expectation. It is certain that the Lord will be the source of peace for this world. So as we make this journey once again into the season of Advent, let us not be in such a hurry to get to Christmas. And let us not ignore the message of Isaiah. Advent once again reminds us that our salvation is not yet complete. There's more to the story of God's salvation for us. We long for the day when the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Lord and God. And until that day, we live in obedience and in truth, praying, come quickly, Lord Jesus. This world is not yet our home. And Advent brings to light the need for us to be ready for when Jesus does come again. It might be today. Anybody think Jesus is coming today? It might be next week, next year, or even 100 years from now. 
But as the Apostle Paul tells us, and do this, understanding the present time, the hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. To state that in another way, and in the words and the context of the prophet Isaiah, let us walk in the light. We have learned from God. Let us walk in the light, being obedient to God and trusting in his truth so that we are ready and expecting the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. Are you ready? Let's pray together. Gracious God, we thank you for your living word that penetrates into the places where even surgeons can't reach. Your word is transforming. It is life-giving. And so we're thankful for the prophets that we get to read about, the truths that they proclaim to us even after all these years. So Father, help us to concentrate on the message of Isaiah, one that we are to be repentant because it is through repentance and humility where we find true preparation for your presence. And help us to look for that day where every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to your glory. But until that day, help us to worship while we wait, being obedient to all that you've asked us to do and bringing other people into the, the fold of Christ for your glory and for the sake of your kingdom. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.